this, but you know, it particularly peaked in um, late December, early early January, and the interest, as evidenced by you know the, the Twitter engagement, just went off the charts. That was that was peak bull mania. I haven't experienced that since uh, the 2021 bull market rush, and it was quite crazy. It's died down again, but the ETF certainly have not died down. Eric, how would you rate the launch out of ten so far? Um, a, a 10. Um, I mean, come on, this is like the best launch in ETF history, in my opinion. Um, now, I will say one thing. If if we were in week five or whatever we're in, we're like whatever, day 24 or something like that mm -hmm. in terms of trading days, I th the reason I'm giving it a 10 instead of a 9 or an 8 is because of the second win, which I'm calling it. Because normally in a new launch, especially one that's been like hyped up, you'll see a lot of interest beforehand and obviously these 11 were all in competition mode because they wanted to prove to everybody they were going to get assets early they lined up friends and family so i'm not totally surprised the first week or two w there was a good amount of interest in the nine new ones um what i am surprised about is the last couple days were ridiculous i mean they, they were they were almost better than the first couple days and mm -hmm. uh, there was a day 13 14 15 right in there there was a dip down and it looked like okay GBTC's outflows are minimizing, but so is the nine strength. And I thought they would be correlated and they'd sort of settle into an equilibrium of like maybe net 50 million a day. But then the last couple of days, they've netted like well over 300 million, sometimes half a billion. That second wind is really good. That tells me there's a lot of incoming. Um, it's not just uh, the, hustle point, the hustle factor of all these issuers lining up their best um, friends and family and big clients and getting everybody on the horn to all their you know people this has to be probably a combination of the volume and the assets are high enough that it's starting to give i think people who were maybe curious about it a little more cover okay hey there's people coming to this party i don't think it's not like a flop um also uh, the fees being this low are also are a uh, very good factor so you got the high volume and the low fees those are the two things you need for a category to have organic growth so those two things were were out out of the gate and i think the price performance probably helped there was that sell the news out um decline then it kind of got the price got strength so as you see more green days uh you're probably going to have more people who are like okay i've got the low fees the high volume i've got these brand name issuers and it's not tanking um, you know, let me call somebody. And then what's going to happen now, which is, you know, just interesting is to see, uh, it's going to create, like, it will create a little bit of FOMO, I think, because as people see, especially in the BlackRock Fidelity, these bigger issuers, uh, advisors are going to wonder, well, I don't want to be the one without it. Cause then I'll, I'll get yelled at. Like, so there's going to be a little bit of a, like a peer pressure factor with advisors, I think. And I, they wouldn't have felt that if there was this sort of wind down into the second month where, okay, fine, they trade 50 million a day. But because they are popping off so much still, um, I think it's actually going to feed on itself a bit. So that's my assessment of, of the first uh, week. And I just did the numbers. There was actually 65 ETFs launched in January. So even though we focused on the nine new ones and GBTC uh, with 100% of our time, basically, there was 55 other ETFs launched. So the Bitcoin ETFs made up 15%, no, 13% of all the new launches in January, but have 83% of the assets. Again, this is why it's so unusual to be pulling these kind of numbers out early. Many of the ETFs, about half of the list of the 65 have less than 20 million. That's normal. You know, like I said, that's why I think there were people who called it underwhelming or whatever. I I, I, I'm an ETF guy, and so the relativity of it was mind-blowing to me. But I suppose with the hype and everything, you had to raise your, your standards. But even with those standards, I think it, it blew them away. So I'll end there. That's sort of my assessment uh, as of today. Uh, thank you for that. That's, a, that's really good. So what I want to do is just take, give the listeners a little bit of um, uh, background as well in terms of what we've done so far. As you mentioned, we've had 24 trading days, just over a, a calendar month uh, since the launch. And... If we start with Grayscale's outflows, all eyes were on Grayscale's outflows and perhaps, you know, you know Fidelity and BlackRock's inflows. Um, on the first day, Grayscale's performance was 
kind of muted. The, the, the outflows were only 95 million when they, people did really expect at least, at least in the hundreds of millions. Um, from day two onwards, though, it was between 400 and 640 million in outflows for about a week. And then it started to taper off after the first week. And so that, that coincided, perhaps even led the so-called sell the news action on the Bitcoin price, where we saw the dip of, of around about 18 to 20%. But as soon as Grayscale's outflows started to moderate, we started seeing um, inflows increase and go positive as well. I mean, the inflows from a net perspective were negative, but from a, uh, an absolute numbers perspective, uh, point of view i don't have the column in front of me but they were positive you know they were taking money obviously from day one but from in terms of net inflows that started turning around about day 10 or 11 and it's only been up since then i mean we had a brief moment where it was kind of as grayscale was hovering between one and 200 million in outflows but the last week alone in the last five or six trading days the ETFs have taken more than $2 billion net. And Grayscale's outflows have been between 80 or 70 and 130 million, which is basically nothing. Um, if I have a look at the last one, two, seven trading days, only two of those for Grayscale have been above 100, uh, 100 million in outflows. And if I look at the last two, four, six... Um, only one of those days has been a net inflow for the whole set of ETFs under 400 million. So it's essentially been 400, 540, 493. And then, Eric, that big monster day two days ago of 631 in net inflows, primarily driven by BlackRock. And I want to I wanna ask you about how you're seeing the race shape up because prior to the launch, we I guess there was... Um, I, I don't know if it was consensus, but there was some commentary around the fact that it's going to be one big ETF that's going to win this race, and there'll probably be quite a few drop out and uh, not be able to attract enough funds to remain viable. In addition to that, we're expecting a fee war, which has probably come on board. Of, of, we've seen a fee war, fee reduction, much quicker than perhaps anticipated. Um, so how do you see... First of all, the race shaping up with there's essentially a top two and then there's another two making up the top four. How do you see that shaping up? And then perhaps could you add some comments about the viability of some of the others after that? Yeah, sure. So um, this is the week, I think, where iBit is broken away. Um, it, you know, they were always the favorite because they're BlackRock, but my Lord, what, the, what IBIT is doing this week is unbelievable. Let me give you some relativity here. So if you look at IBIT's history of trading volume, it's already traded about $3 billion this week. Okay, that's almost double its best week so far, and we still have like a day and a half. So it's probably going to hit somewhere $4.5 billion. So it will be, you know, 150% jump in volume. Again, that's weird. Normally the volume would shrink a little after the big hype. Um, and then if you look at Fidelity, its volume historically this week is it's probably going to break its record, but barely like it's the, the relativity of Fidelity to itself and BlackRock to itself is where I'm seeing iBit really break away. And this isn't a surprise. BlackRock has multiple like dozens of ETFs that are really liquid, beloved by the trading crowd, whether it's HYG for junk bonds or IVV for the S&P. Uh, MUB for munis, you name it, right? They got a lot of these. They're known for having highly liquid trading ETFs. So this is their wheelhouse. Fidelity isn't really an ETF player. Like they're getting more into it. And I think they're going to have a big year this year. But they have a, they're like the 14th biggest issuer. BlackRock's one, right? Second, um, Fidelity, I think what they're benefiting from is their advisors and their own funds. But that's not really volume. That, that will help with assets. Volume is a special thing, and that, that's, that means that iBit is, using, is being used more by um, actual trading desks, uh, potentially, and down the road it could be used, with, especially when it gets options, by institutions. So it looks like this week iBit is really breaking away. It's probably going to be the, the one, the GLD of this race. Fidelity is a no slouch. It's 
going to be just fine. It's already at four point two billion in assets. I see it gathering, a, you know, a ton of assets. But it, I, I just don't like what I'm seeing this week. I just don't know if it's going to catch IBIT and liquidity. Arc B and Bit B are both over a billion. Again, whacked. That would be again if if one if one of them a new like put it this way of the sixty five launches in January. Only four are over a billion, and they're the four Bitcoin ETFs. So again, it, if there was no BlackRock and Fidelity, Arc and Bitwise would be the two best launches of the year so far. Um, and then you look at Galaxy, three hundred million, uh, Vanek, one eighty seven, Franklin, ninety three, um, and all of those right there, ninety three. Those are the eight other ones. They're all profitable, so they're not going anywhere. The only one, the Valkyrie and the w Wisdom Tree, and Wisdom Tree is twenty six million. Again, that still ranks it as 20th out of the 65 new launches in January. So again, if you take away the hype and all the attention, you'd say, well, this one's pr having a pretty good start. It's, you know, in the top third of the new launches. Um, and Wisdom Tree is also very committed to the space. They have a lot of ETFs in Europe. They also can subsidize a couple months of not making money on this. Clearly, they've got a lot of hit products. Uh, it's not really a problem for them. I don't see them closing shop on this. And if you're a Wisdom Tree, uh, if you're running Wisdom Tree, you want your salespeople to have a Wisdom Tree spot Bitcoin ETF when they're talking to advisors, just in case an advisor brings it up, they don't want to recommend a competitor. So I believe they're going to not close that. So I think the all nine will be here next year. I originally thought there would be one or two that would not make it, but the more I see all of the activity, the more I'm confident the nine will last. And I will say they're probably going to be some wacky stuff tried, like long Bitcoin, short carbon credits, or, you know, just name it. Spaghetti will be thrown at the wall. A lot of leveraged Bitcoin ETFs. Some of those may come and go. But the nine that launched and great and GBTC, I'd be willing to bet a sushi lunch are here one year from now and all, you know, in profit zones. So uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but that would be my status on the race itself. Yeah, no, that's that's great. So you mentioned um, assets versus trading. Now we're we're all hodlers. We all hold, and uh, so we're really interested in in demand, and we can see that in um, in in flows into bit you know, the Bitcoin ETFs. Can you just explain to us why um, trading volume is so important, and who is that important to? Yeah. Okay. Here's why volume is really important, and it's the most coveted of all metrics for any ETF. And the reason is that. If you have a high volume, because it can all be grown organically, naturally in the market, but if you get a lot of volume, you will start to attract bigger and bigger fish because the one thing that institutional investors, whether it's a large pension, endowment, a hedge fund, they get the, the red carpet rolled out to them by these big asset managers, whatever they want in private. You know, It's like being a rich person. You Actually, everything's free for you, like a celebrity. Um, but the one thing they can't get anywhere else is liquidity. And liquidity for them is really useful because it it's, makes it easy to get in and out of something. It They can do it anonymously in ETFs. Nobody knows it's them. And there's no real impact cost. They could come in big, like $300 million trade, and barely move the market and be unnoticed. And so as one of these gets more liquid, it's going to attract bigger and bigger institutional and trader type investors. And once it gets those, the liquidity grows even more, and then it attracts even bigger fish. So... And when you have that much liquidity and you're that big, you don't really ever need to do the fee war anymore. You you basically have pricing power. So that's why GLD to this day is still 40 bips. They don't need to lower the fee um, because, you know, let everybody else fight the fee war. Um, we have liquidity. You don't. And you, you want liquidity. You're going to pay up a little bit for it. So that's why all the issuers want it. That's why the institutions find that important. Um, and remember, in 2008, that was a big year for ETFs because even the bond ETFs, bonds had been like very illiquid during 2008 at times, but TLT and HYG, these ETFs traded. And so that was the year where institutions really noticed that, oh, you know, I don't need an ETF for my long-term investment. I can use a separately managed account. But for quick trades, uh, especially for things that are a pain in the butt to get a, to get a, um, um, on my own, and I would put Bitcoin in that category. I don't think these institutions want to do a cold wallet or anything like that. Mm. So GLD is popular with them because they can just basically complete a portfolio. They can go short if they wanted to. So that volume is basically like a gigantic like magnet for bigger investors. Whereas you could have a lot of assets and low volume, and that is that's not the spermone that institutional investors 
are responding to. Assets are certainly good and they're nice, but assets can be moved very easily. Like volume, again, is a special thing, can only be grown organically. And once you get it, um, it's almost impossible to steal. That's why GLD, again, still the most traded ETF 25 years later or whatever, 20 years later, despite many, many cheaper options. And so that is why we track volume, even though a lot of the crypto people um, get kind of frustrated. But I'm telling you, long term, volume is major. And if you ask all these issuers, um, to them, that's that's the holy grail. Assets are right there, obviously. Those are the one, two things that are the most important to them. But the thing with volume is that they're, because of the down the snowball rolling downhill effect, volume begets more volume. There usually can only be one volume giant. And at first, it you know, now we're starting to see IBIT emerge as that. Mm, I guess, uh, yeah, so it, it's all very well spending money to get in the door, but can you get out the door with, with minimal friction and cost as well? So I, I guess a lot of institutions who, who might be considering or whose, whose allocation would be, would be large relative to... Um, you know their port the portfolio, so um, they they need to understand whether or not they can get in and out with minimal friction. So, okay, um, who who is um who is buying at the moment? Because you mentioned the relative strengths of uh, BlackRock and Fidelity. Um, have you had any sort of inkling as to who is buying right now? Because there's a little bit of conversation on on Twitter at the moment that you know virtually um, no retail sentiment increasing at all. Um, are they buying through ETFs and just staying offline? Um, as because, you know, we don't we don't we don't expect boomers who are more likely to invest in through ETFs to then come online and talk about it typically. Um, they they're in the minority on Twitter. But um, is that in fact happening? Are we seeing demand come through advisors or is this institutional allocation? Who's, who's actually buying right now? Uh, yeah, this is why, you know, ETFs is a little bit of, a, you know, an art as much as a science in terms of analysis, because we, we, we don't know the pe we don't have, we, we, there's HDS, which is the holder screen. And right now there's three people who have reported holding it. And one is a mutual fund, two mutual funds, and then an advisor. Those are the three sort of reported holdings. So that would give you some inkling that there are some non-retail, obviously, buying it. Um, I would say, though, that the average trade size for IBIT is 566. Um, and there's been, you know, 50,000 trades a day. That would indicate to me that there are some a lot of smaller investors buying. But if I look at AQR, which is our, if you have a terminal, it's, it, it gives you all the trades that day, uh, sort of sorted by size. There was a $874,000 trade this morning, um, 194000 These are pretty big trades. And then as I scroll through and I go to page three or four, it gets down to, you know, smaller numbers. But the, the spectrum is really good. You want the spectrum. You want a couple biggies. You want some medium ones and you want some tiny ones. That'd be that's like the perfect... And it, it looks like you're you're getting that um, in IBIT anyway, I think. So um, given the size and the number of trades, it looks like there are a lot of smaller investors here. And that's not totally surprising because, again, I don't think you're going to get real big fish until the liquidity. Uh, you know, when IBIT starts averaging 800 to a billion a day right now, this week it's averaging 700 million. So it's closing in. It's really, I think, a billion a billion is when you're in the top like 30 most traded ETFs in the world. And at that point, e even the biggest institution is going to like, you know, you're going to meet its criteria for like having a lot of liquidity. So we're close already after a month. Um, but the sizes are small. Once again, you get into those bigger institutions, uh, the size, the average size is probably going to grow a little bit. Um, but again, I, I don't, I'm not surprised. I would see advisors using this predominantly. Um, I would see smaller investors getting interested, but the smaller investors, uh, remember in 2021, um, when Bitto launched, it really felt like small investor fever. I mean, even my friends were asking me about it and the trade size was, was really small. That was like almost all retail. This does feel like a more like, like after post FTX, um, era where you don't have that sort of like retail mania right now. And a lot of those retail investors, if they are into crypto, they might be on Coinbase and maybe, you know, you know, maybe they're just happy there or whatever, or they got their own wallet. Um, 
So, and the ones that were tourists, maybe they were once bitten twice shy by the FTX or they bought it like $60,000 and they're underwater. So I would say that the, the retail crowd probably isn't as big as it would have been if these launched in 2021. I would agree with that. But based on the sizes, there's definitely a lot of small activity here. There's a little bit of interest. I'm, I'm interested, um, I wonder if I could just put you on the spot now. Um, you know, we talk about the flippening of um, the, um, the Bitcoin market cap compared to gold. But if we can compare just for now the total um, assets of Bitcoin ETFs, including GBTC versus gold, I saw... I saw a number the other day that was something in the order of like 70 or 80 billion for gold and about 30 or 28 billion for Bitcoin. Are you able to give us an update on that? Do you, is, is yeah. That? You're, well, no, you're, you're the Bitcoin, if we include GBTC, yeah. we're at 36.7 billion. So that's, um, that's almost so half or just, just approaching half. Yeah. It's tricky because... Um, GBTC came over with what? Um, 28 billion uh, or something, yeah. 28, yeah. 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 So it, it's a tricky number because, like, some people reporting early on when these came out, hey, Bit Bitcoin ETFs already passed silver. Well, I mean, come on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's more impressive if the nine do it, but um, I guess at by the time these get to gold, it's all going to be legit, legit. I think the GBTC just made it weird the first couple days because how much is coming in, going to the other ones, whatever. But I feel like with GBTC's limited outflows now, we're now into sort of like a fresh frontier where most of the volume and the flows that are going into the nine are obviously coming from other places and more natural and organic. And we can kind of leave GBTC and the pre-plan investors behind us. And if you look at the past couple of days and you consider, okay, maybe these things take in like a billion or two a week, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how many weeks in a year, right? So there's, that's, all, that's 50, 50 billion. Um, and if the price com if the price were to be flat, you may already be there in twelve months passing gold at that rate. I don't think they'll maintain a billion a week rate. They're, I mean, they're actually more than a billion a week right now. But I, I do think there'll be maybe some kind of a flattening of that. But maybe even if they did three four hundred million a week, again, which would feel like a little bit of a letdown. But again, for any normal category, that's a lot. Yeah. That would put them past gold in twelve months. And if the price of Bitcoin goes up. Remember, assets can go up by flows or price appreciation, then it would be expedited. If the price of Bitcoin went down, I would say that ha passing gold, might you might have to put that off a little. Um, because not only would the price going down make the assets go a little lower, but the interest in it through new inflows might be subsided a little. Because, again, nothing sells you know new ETFs like the price going up. So um, I would say if, if we get more, if, if this week is any indicator... You're looking at like passing gold within a year, but if we have some shakiness or a rough patch ahead, um, it could be could take like a, a two years or something. But I, I looks looks pretty good. So I want to take you up on that point in just a second because I want to give our listeners a little bit of uh, background. The nine new Bitcoin ETFs, so excluding Grayscale, have more than thirteen billion in total Bitcoin assets at the moment. Around about six of that uh, could be attributed to the GBTC outflows. We're all, we shouldn't even make that assumption. Let's just say Grayscale has lost six billion, so it kind of nets off to about six or seven billion fresh money coming into the space. Compare that, that 13 billion to um, what, what's goals? Is it, is it just under 80 billion now? I, I know the price of the asset is. Um, has gone down in the last two or three days, so it's under two thousand now. Um, but you know, let's just give it seventy-five million. That's not bad. <laughs> That's not bad at all. So there, there was some snide comments about uh, Bitcoin before the launch that uh, suggested there was not any demand, um, especially given the presence of ETFs around the world that investors, if they really wanted to buy it, could have bought it which was kind of dismissive of, uh, you know, the barriers to entry and the friction to, to um, holding Bitcoin for a lot of people who just don't want to go through all of that, including institutions and, you know, retirees and the like. Um, yeah, no, yeah. It, no, it's like if you're a band and you make a vinyl record, <laughs> right, that'd be like the cold wallet. Yeah. Sure, anybody can go buy a vinyl record. You got to go to a record player, set it, I mean, this is like putting Bitcoin on Spotify, okay? That's how 
good ETFs are and how trusted. They're available on every exchange. You click one button and you own it, whatever that is. Don't ever underestimate convenience and how lazy people are. Um, so I, I was dealing with all the crypto people early on about the wallet thing. And I'm like, dude, 12 words the rest of my life. I can't remember my Amazon password. And that's I use Amazon a lot. Uh, so I know myself, you know, and I'm in the financial world. Um, I, I wouldn't I would not do the wallet thing. Um, I also trust these firms. I have no problem oh, can you, with it. Can you tell us why you do? Can you tell us why? Because, you know, trust is a big issue for Bitcoiners. Um, we're uh, notoriously mistrustful of <laughs> authority. I mean, that's a sort of stems. Uh, yeah. yeah. So could you just speak on that for us? Why do you trust them? Uh, why do investors trust them? Why um, aren't they being sold paper Bitcoin as such? Like um, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of people suspect that, you know, gold isn't fully accounted yeah. for as well. First of all, if you're really, if you think, if you're all about, hey, FDR confiscated the gold, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm in this for some real serious reasons. I don't trust the monetary system. You should do a wallet, uh, no doubt. I mean, there are gold bugs who really should just get gold bars. Um, they should not use the ETF. I think just for normal people, though, this is much easier. The reason I trust these companies is, A, I've been covering them for 20 years. I know the people who work there, and I know how important uh, their reputation is, right? That if they have one incident, um, believe me, I've seen it. Like XIV was a big incident like five years ago. It tarnishes the whole ETF brand and industry. And this industry really uh, values its, its uh, reputation. And so you'd have a massive reputational risk if they had any problems with this. Um, the other thing is these are all approved through the 1933 Act outside of the 1940 Act. Is it very rigorous regulation? I mean, have you read the 19 before or the S1? Uh, you probably didn't because they're like over 100 pages each. And it's a bunch of legal stuff. And all that stuff could be uh, used in court. I mean, this is a lot of legal um, legality attached to these things. And in the 20 years of a gold ETF, has there been a problem? I mean, at some point, the actual track record of the institution has to matter. But in my opinion, when I've, I've been an ETF analyst, the reason I love ETFs and dedicated my life into it is because it's a good industry. It's a clean industry. The investors tend to win um, because the fees are low. And when I see other scandals that have happened in my career, they've been in hedge funds, no offense, but they've been in crypto. Um, and they've been in places where you don't have to go through the crucible of the sort of regulatory fire, right? And you don't have to have this reputation uh, because remember, they're serving, um, you know, millions and millions of advisors who are managing the money of millions of households. This is no joke. Um, and these companies are you know, very aware of their responsibility and their public relations risks if anything went wrong. Um, someone like SBF, young kid, you know, d this is just like one guy gone crazy. You just can't have that here. Yeah, but there, uh, there, is, are, there is a distinction story. to be made, isn't there? It was kind of what I'm alluding to. There are, there are various responsibilities that are delineated. They're not all centralized, whereas yeah, FTX did not have those. Uh, I'm, I'm alluding to things like auditing, for example. Oh, yeah. I mean, and how about like 30 lawyers? I mean, or, or they maybe they did have lawyers, but he didn't listen to them. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But this is a, th these are uh, registered advisors. The funds are registered. I mean, everything is by the book, um, which, again, this is part of the reason that like even someone like my mom who was over the night, she was like, was would never consider this. But now that sort of they were SEC approved and they got brand names that she knows of, it's a big deal. Um, you know, these BlackRock is... Um, widely known to the biggest asset manager on planet earth um fidelity has been around um i think their first fund i got it was i forget how old they are 80 years old I mean, this are, these are gigantic monster companies i mean these these companies are are older a lot of them than obviously than the uh, bitcoin itself right mm. so um anyway i'll end it there but those would be the reasons i trust these firms now the whole idea of the government confiscating that is an interesting question. Like, would these companies say no to the government? Uh, probably not. I mean, I think they would do whatever the, the government and the law told them to do. And if that's something you think is a risk, I would do cold wallet or whatever. I don't, you're not an ETF candidate, but everybody who buys funds in general, say it's the S&P 500 fund from BlackRock or uh, a junk bond fund from State Street, the whole point of a fund is that you want, you're happy to outsource this. 
Most <laughs> people are too busy, too lazy, too uninterested to do any work. They just want to own a couple tickers and have access to all this stuff, have a diversified portfolio, and then get on with their life. So for a lot of the crypto world, this, this is a big part of their life. For most people who would use an ETF, they don't want this to be a big part of their life, and that's why they would use the ETF. But for me, and what, the reason I advocated for ETF approval all along wasn't because I believed in Bitcoin so much. It was that I, I believed in the ETFs would give people the best possible deal versus GBTC or MicroStrategy or using one of these exchanges that charges an arm and a leg per trade. Um, ETFs, in, in my opinion, uh, are the best possible shot at a good deal for investors and a clean industry with a track record. Oh, yeah. And, and Michael Saylor's made the case uh, many times that, you know, self-custody is not for everybody. It's not possible for everybody to self-custody. MicroStrategy cannot self-custody. <laughs> it, it just would not be possible for a, for a publicly listed company to, to, to go through all of that. Um, the risks far outweigh um, any kind of benefit for, for them anyway. Um, you know, at the start of our discussion today, you sort of alluded to uh, the cultural changes that an ETF brings about when uh, an advisor is having a conversation with a uh, client. Can you, can you go through that a little bit uh, in, in a little bit more detail for us. And so why why does that make such a big difference? How ubiquitous are ETFs? And does it, does it really make that much of a difference for um, for clients? What, that it's in an ETF? Yeah. It, I mean, again, um, we there's a phrase in the broker advisor business that has been around for a long time called, you can't get fired for putting your client in IBM. You know, mm -hmm. like, and so we, we have this uh, note we put out in this theme that, you know, you can't be, you, as an advisor, you really can't get fired for uh, putting a client in an iShares or Vanguard ETF. I would almost extend that just to the ETF brand. Um, they are, uh, advisors are always worried about career risk. And so for them, I think that's a big reason the ETF is a, is a big deal, especially if you have some of these brand names involved. So um, that that's important um, because they, they, want that sort of feeling of cover. Uh, SEC approved it, big companies involved, ETFs is a structure that everybody could agree with. That way they can defend this move to their client if the price were to just go, you know, crazy on the downside. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, because it's enough to explain a volatile asset that has a bad year, but then you got to explain why you were, like for GBTC, why was I in an OTC traded uh, thing that where the price didn't have anything to do with the NAV? Why was I in MicroStrategy stock? You know, this is is at least you can explain everything, but the you know the the everything else is has you can defend, and I think the ETFs give the advisors that um, for sure that you wouldn't get in other structures, even a mutual fund. I think mutual funds have started to get a bad name and a reputation for being uh, very expensive and pricey, and the the capital gains taxes are nasty, and so even. That might get a question, but it'd be rare for a client to really give um, give an advisor a hard time for using the ETF structure. Um, so, and I, that's off, but why I think the tickers were so sober: IBIT, FBTC, mm -hmm. BitB. A couple of them are a little wild, but I think it's because the, the asset class does enough craziness for like an older investor or an advisor that everything else should be as structured and sober as possible just to sort of offset how wild and the asset class is. And for frankly, a lot of people still don't even know what the use case is. So all of that gets offset by the ETF, the, 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 the regulation. All that, I think, is important for any investor who might have been a little more apprehensive if it was just going out in the wild and signing up for a crypto exchange account. So do you think there's been a little bit of... Um rehabilitation of Bitcoin's reputation amongst, uh, I guess, the traditional investors and, and Wall Street because it's now wrapped up in an ETF? Yes. This is why when, when Larry Fink went on Fox Business and said it's new gold, and I mean, that's a big moment. Huge. Um, Huge. And obviously, so yes, I also the relentlessness of Bitcoin. I mean, this is cockroach level <laughs> survivability here. I mean, this thing will not go away. Um and that, that's something about it I respect. And obviously, when you meet the people and the, and the passion they have, it's, you can see why. Um, I still, you know, I still can understand the doubts. But 
the fact that a lot of these, um, uh, you know, people have come around on it, especially, you know, someone like Larry Fink, that means a lot. Um, and there's the Fidelity, obviously, is a even though Abigail Johnson, who runs Fidelity, doesn't do a lot of press famously, um, you know, she's really into it. The Franklin person is into it. Now, these, these issuers probably have a, a self-interest because they can make some revenue. Although I will, I do think the ETF is a win-win for them uh, because, or a win-win, they can make revenue where there was none for them, but they can also lower the fees overall versus the intermediaries that are out there now. So uh, I have no problem with that. That's good capitalism. So I think all of them, you know, everybody has, you know, their own interests here, but having those kind of people um, advocate, it's almost like saying it's safe. In fact, I thought that BlackRock should have done, if anybody's going to do a Super Bowl ad, it's not ETF style to spend that big, but if anybody did, BlackRock could have done one where they just showed all the scandals like SBF and all the stuff and the sort of famous pictures of uh, Bitcoin and the crises that it's gone through and then just like stop and then just be like, it's okay now the adults are here. And that's essentially the subtext of all this, in my opinion. Hmm. Yeah, I, I wonder. <laughs> I, I, you may disagree, but as somebody who's not deep in crypto, I feel as though this is like the adults have arrived moment. Oh no, I don't. I don't disagree with you. Yeah. I've, I've got a. Um, I've got a background in traditional banking, not not investment banking or trading, but um, more on the commercial side. So I. I understand um the reticence of traditional finance and how extremely conservative they are compared to our outlook i mean i've, I've always considered myself an outsider within all the companies that i worked in and just felt like a fish out of water and you know I, I try to maintain a similar kind of perspective within bitcoin as well and while you know wherever there's sort of an overlap with my personality and values i'm i let that flow out but otherwise i try to maintain an independent perspective as much as possible as well. So I agree with um, that um, in terms of how this whole development is perceived. It is very much as sort of the grown-ups, uh, which is, you know, to us it comes across as uh, condescending, but th that is how it is perceived. Um, let's yeah, and I, yeah. it's not it's not meant to mean offense. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. It's just, I'm just, that's my raw, I mean, I, I always give my raw, honest take. That That's... Oh, no, no, I, if, I didn't again, mean to feign offence at what you said. Sorry, I'm agreeing with yeah. you. I'm just putting it into context. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not taking that personally or as an affront at all. I agree with you. You know, this is a this is a very, um, it's a burgeoning industry. It's a nascent industry with, a, you know, did not have many rules to start with and those rules and structures are starting to take shape now. So, you know, to say that the industry is maturing uh, with the introduction of uh, standardised financial products and, and, and the introduction of Wall Street players as well as adults in the room is not an offensive analogy at all. It's and it's not a stretch either. So, so I didn't. Uh, yeah, I, I I kind of agree with you. Um, yeah, no, and I'm sort of speaking to anybody who would find that because I yeah. I do find like there is a tension in my replies on Twitter and like generally speaking, and I get this tension, which is on the one hand, hey, we're we're kind of punk rock. We're on the outside of the system. This is supposed to be a currency that is out, you know, outside of, of all that traditional banking. And then here you have the, you know, biggest asset managers in the world sort of co-opting that mission. Even Larry Fink saying how, you know, if you don't trust your government, this is like a good investment. Um, that's got to feel a little weird. Yeah. Um, and perhaps even a co conflicting, but on the, on the flip side, Hey, look, uh, it's good for the price. So, um, it, it is an interesting, like I said, this is one of the reasons I've been so obsessed with this. There's so many layers to un, uh, unpeel here and so many subplots and a lot of emotion and again a clashing of cultures investment philosophies asset classes uh, and even generations um so i see all that which is why i've you know become pretty obsessed um and that's obviously it's more than just hey these etfs are launching so i do think there's a lot going on that that we unpack here and certainly that that internal conflict uh of the industry of the crypto world itself sort of letting wall street in in a way co-op this mission is is an interesting step right now well i i think the culture clash is a really interesting thing and also an inevitable um 
um, development as well. There was no world in which Bitcoin was going to become a global reserve asset without Wall Street coming to the party. That just was not going to happen. It could not have happened. Um, and so if you think that Bitcoin is going to become a global reserve asset, and we all cheer that on, we all cheer that on. You know, I've tweeted, I've made tweets along those themes and they get huge engagement and, you know, everybody participates and adds their two cents worth. You know, it's, it's a fairly common sort of refrain that that's what we want it to become. There's absolutely no world in which that happens without Wall Street. It just, <laughs> it just can't happen without Wall Street. And the other thing on the flip side of that, and we often say to people who express opinions that we don't care much for, is that Bitcoin doesn't care its code and it will continue operating regardless of your opinion. And that's essentially what's happening here, is that a bunch of people from traditional finance are packaging Bitcoin up for their customers in a way that they want it accessible. And Bitcoin doesn't care that <laughs> some of us don't like it. Bitcoin doesn't care that we want to self-custody. As long as we continue to have that option, and we will, because you know that's, that's the technical sort of design and the infrastructure surrounding that will always enable that. So I don't see any problem with that, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm all for accessibility as a first step. And then once, they've, once an investor has taken that step towards Bitcoin to encourage them towards self-custody where that's possible and viable. Yeah. Um, that's really interesting. You mentioned second wind before. Um, you know, because we've we've been talking for about forty five minutes now, and you know we've had a really good summary of what's happened, measured that against expectations, and now I'm kind of looking like, okay, that was a, I think it was an amazing month, and I suspect that we may be just on the precipice of seeing some FOMO kick in because there's kind of like a virtuous, self perpetuating cycle of. Money comes in, price goes up, price goes up, more money comes in. So um, I'm just wondering how you see it playing out. If we break all-time highs and suddenly, you know, the, the hype comes in and the FOMO kicks in, um, how do you see that playing out? Yeah, I mean, if we're looking at the last two weeks, what's it up, 20%, 10% each week, mm. something like that? Yeah. Um, so I always look to QQQ. QQQ is the locomotive of the stock market this this is like the top nasdaq 100 companies it's like the magnificent seven right mm -hmm. and we all have high weighting in this index and so that's up one percent last week and down one percent this week so it's a little bit on the flat side if that if you have relative performance like that that's going to help um and yes there's definitely a cycle uh we see this that said you know the etf isn't the only part of the market uh, i think there are obviously, I think the ETFs own 4% of all Bitcoin, but how much of the float or the available market that people are willing to trade, maybe it's less. I mean, you know, it's a higher percent. Um, so yeah, there, there certainly flows matter. They impact the price. They're not the only thing because there was a couple week, weeks there, two weeks there where largely speaking, the net nine took in more than GBTC saw in outflows, but the price went down regardless. And so, oh, you know, you will see times where the flows and the price are not connected. It's it's pretty normal. Um, that said, you start to return 10% a week and the stock market is, you know, a little flatter. Uh, good things will probably happen. I mean, we've, like I said, we call it the shiny object moment. Um, that said, you know, the one, the one thing that makes Bitcoin different here is that people do have some awareness of it. A lot of times an ETF comes out of nowhere like ARK, which was innovation stocks or something like robotics. And that, like, the stars just align for that particular theme. And it's like, it really is a shiny object. No one's seen it before, and everybody kind of jumps in. Bitcoin is somewhat more known. So that's why the FOMO could take a little longer than normal, because there is this, you know, barrier potentially mentally that, hey, it's, it's up, yeah, but it just went down and it's volatile. Um, but, you know, nothing. there's nothing like price to change sentiment. Um, so... You know, another week of this, um, it can't hurt. And obviously the flows will help. So, yeah, um, it looks, like I said, oh, this is a really good, like all the, if I'm a weatherman, man, it just looks like sunny skies right now. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I, I feel that way, but I don't, you know, I don't know the ETF industry and I don't understand 
how allocations are going to be made from here on in. Have you heard any sort of murmurs about, any rumors about uh, allocations to Bitcoin and uh, whether or not there are any signposts that some investors might be waiting for? Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of advisors are connected to these platforms um, because they get like benefits from being part of the like sort of platform, like, you know, like, for example, Morgan Stanley advisors are all over the country. They have managed four trillion advisory assets and like they have to listen to what the home office says. So that's the price they pay for getting all the perks of being a Morgan Stanley advisor. Um, and the home office is in New York and they decide what ETFs are on the quote platform. So there's many of these platforms. Uh, there are, I think, 23 trillion of the 30 trillion, um, something like that. I think the RIAs might be 10. Some, it's in ballpark. Anyway. It's not on any platforms yet. Um, so a lot of them are waiting to even be allowed to invest in it. Uh, so that's also pretty good news. If you can do all these flows without being on any of the platforms, it's like selling like salad dressing and you haven't been accepted into the big food stores yet. That's a good sign, right? Yeah. Because once you get in the food stores, that should help. So I do think platform adoption will come because these ETFs are looking really potent. And the platform adoption is interesting. It's um, I don't know if you remember that ad campaign back in the day. I want my MTV. Oh yeah, because they wouldn't they wouldn't air MTV on cable stations. But that's why the MTV had that uh, got all the music stars to say, "I want my MTV." You're supposed to call your cable provider locally and say, "Can you please? I want my MTV." And that that's how MTV got into all the TVs in America. This is probably going to happen here. You're going to find advisors at Morgan Stanley who are sitting there. And being like, look, I got my client asking me about this thing, this I bet or whatever. Um, can you get it? And they're going to, you know, the more they get those requests, the more the pressure will come. Because some of them have pretty pretty strict rules about waiting three months at least or seeing a certain amount of assets. Mm. I think the assets and the volume number should be fine. I think the time period, though, you know, they want to see a track record. And some of them want you to pay them, to be frank. Uh, <laughs> it's a lot of like, hey, give me money if you want to be on my shelf. Um but the way around that is I want my MTV, which is this sort of grassroots demand from the network of advisors. And I think this is the price action and the attention it's getting will probably help that, uh, where the advisors don't want to look like idiots. I met with one advisor in the Miami conference recently who said they weren't able to get their advisor, Jeppy, which is this popular JP Morgan product. And he said, because he was in the LPL network, and it was like, piss them off, because it's like, now I look like an idiot in front of my client. Like, why can't you get that? And so that is where it's at. And that ultimately, based on the numbers I'm seeing, will probably happen. Um, if these things didn't trade much, and they sort of like died down to like 20 million a day trading or something, and uh, mm -hmm. the flows kind of leveled off, then it would be more of just BlackRock salespeople working the Morgan Stanley home office. But the way it's looking now, it sh they should be receiving a lot of incoming calls, and that should like force and pressure them to add. Because something like ARC was also added this way. Like, there's been ETFs that have just uh, made it impossible for the platforms to not have them on. They were just too popular. Uh, you, you you just you'd piss off all your advisor network. Whereas other new launches. You could just not have them on and nobody notices because they're not that popular. Um, are there any technical barriers or is it really just about policy from these uh, advisor platforms or networks to putting Bitcoin, the ETFs on their platforms? No technical barriers. In fact, that's the whole beauty of the ETF. It fits firmly in the plumbing. Um, this would be as easy as adding any of the other 55 other new launches from January. It's a ticker. It's got all the same... Uh, uh, you know, uh, what would I call uh, characteristics of SPY or uh, a stock. So I recall. Sorry, sorry, Eric. Uh, go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no just the, the only potential issue is 33 Act, but I, I don't really know of any platforms that wouldn't allow a 33 Act fund. The good news there is GLD's 33 Act, and that really paved the way. So I know you guys hate gold. I don't hate it. I just don't <laughs> have any use I, for it. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> the gold Bitcoin is a whole nother sort of subplot rivalry that's pretty interesting. Um, but GLD, I think, really paved the way for a non 40 act fund to, uh, you know, be accepted and uh, allowed. So uh, that that blazed the trail. So I don't really see any technical issues. Oh, interesting. You know, last bull market, I, I remember tweeting out the news that Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, 
perhaps some others, were training thousands of wealth advisors on Bitcoin. Have you heard anything about that and what's happened to that? No. Uh, you know, just, you mean the advisors, like, training all of their advisors on how to talk about it, think talk about it? Talk about it, sell it, that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. And now that we've actually yeah, got no, a product, I um, so, yeah. that, you know, what's going on? I haven't heard anything since then. But that was the news at the time. I think it was Morgan Stanley, thousands of advisors, they're training up Goldman Sachs and, and a few others as well. Well, you know, um, all these people are talking to advisors. I would follow Matt Hogan and Hunter Horsley a bitwise because they're really the only ones who tweet out anecdotes all the time. It's really interesting for someone like me because I'm not in those meetings. So I get some win from what they're doing. And, you know, they have, like I said, tw they said they say have 20,000 conversations a year. Um, and, you know, they're doing webinars and talking to them. And uh, the advisors are looking for information. I, by the way, I did hear one anecdote. You guys will love this. This is, um, this is from, I can't say the issuer, but one of the bigger issuers was doing a commodity, a general commodities session strategy session or something like that and when bitcoin came up um all of the old all of the old heads who were the senior managers and stuff were kind of um did, downplayed it a little and the younger people had all the questions about it and then the old people just sort of like let it pass and then um the meeting ended the older people came back to the strategist and, had, and then asked the questions like they didn't want to uh. be they were curious, but didn't want to look like uh, old old heads mm. and lame in front of the younger people. <laughs> so I'm, I'm guessing there's a lot of that kind of stuff that's going to have to shake out over the next couple months. Like people who want education in private, so look like an idiot. Um, but I'm sure these issuers are more than happy to help get that going. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting, yeah, I guess, cultural um, barrier that we need to understand a little bit better as well. That certainly is, I, I recall... This is going to sound absurd to people, but about seven, seven or eight years ago, I was doing a, um, a, a consulting gig at a bank, and it was relayed to me that there was still an executive who reported to the CEO who was skeptical about whether or not the online channel would really, <laughs> would really persist and be successful. I couldn't believe it. Like, here we are, <laughs> you know, what was it, about 16, 17 years after the dot-com bubble burst and this guy is still not convinced by online commerce, you know, that some people really do drag their feet. Um, so it's a, it's a very real barrier, um, that sort of generational divide for technology. And it's, I'm really encouraged to see um, older people get involved in the Twitter discussion as well. And they have so much value um, to bring, particularly, you know, their perspective around investment cycles, other assets that have been launched, and, you know, like, just the history with the gold ETF has been invaluable. So, um... Okay, can, I, can I ask you a question? Um, so, like, one thing I feel like the crypto world could learn from the traditional finance world is just the value of a 60-40 portfolio. Um, as somebody, as you said, who has some financial experience in your career, um, do you, are you, like, are you one of those people who's all in on Bitcoin or is it like something to accent your 60, 40? I know for the traditional finance crowd, there's no way they'll go all in the 60, 40 they love, but I get why they love it. Yeah. I don't um, expect, you know, I don't, so stops. I would never have a starting point, start any conversation with the aim of getting anybody all in. If I can get anybody to just allocate half a percent, 1%, even just buy $500 worth, I would even give someone like 20 bucks worth of Bitcoin because once but, they but, got but, it, but look, but, but actually, hold going. on. Let me let me flip this. Yeah. Back. I get that. I get you saying that to somebody who's old. No, anybody. What about anybody, this? Eric? Anybody? Yeah. So okay. I have a different. What so about you have a you have a perspe perception of, um, I guess, the Bitcoin culture and community. Um, I'm trying to sort of give you my personal view. That's kind of outside of that. I, ha I, I have a lot of views that are outside, and I know the account is quite large, and people expect me to reflect all of <laughs> um, the, the normative uh, cultural aspects of Bitcoin, but I don't. I have my own views on some things like this, and a lot of them are counter to the, cult uh, to the prevailing culture. And I'm hoping, you know, that as I speak up over time, that more people will feel comfortable speaking up uh, with their own personal views and not have to conform. Uh, I'm very against uh, conformity.
I think people should be whoever they are, wherever they are, uh, to, uh, as much as you know possible. So um, I don't talk to people about Bitcoin like that. My own personal position is very different. You know, I've been in relationship management roles. I've been in influencing positions within organizations. And I understand that the best way to actually get people on your side is to understand their perspective first and not harangue them with your own <laughs> uh, objectives and values and whatever. And anyone who's ever done a sales course is always about understand the customer. What are their sensibilities? Try to get them to talk and tell you what their problems are. Unfortunately, um, there are too many people in the Bitcoin space who do the complete opposite of that and should probably go onto Amazon and buy a book that's called How to Win Friends and Influence People because they're absolutely shithouse at it. Um, and, and they think that by haranguing and harassing people with their own um, sensibilities and values that that's kind of a virtue signal to the rest of the community. But what it does is it actually drives people away. You don't get the conversation started. You get people becoming defensive. And sometimes, you know, that, that small impression or small moment of time where you've created a negative impression can lead to many, many years of resistance that you probably will never um, break down. You'll never get that opportunity to reverse. So congratulations, you've just turned someone off, but you've made yourself feel better by virtue signaling. It doesn't work that way. My starting point is meet the person where they are. And so I try to listen to them and see what their objections are, like, you know, like any kind of... Um, conversation where you're trying to understand another person let them talk and whatever their objections are consider them an opportunity and give them a baby step to take and sometimes it is we're literally sitting at a coffee shop and i'll say download this wallet let me show you how easy it is for me to send you five dollars in an instant and it's you know either the lightning network and a lot of for a lot of people they're just amazed by that technical ability to do that Someone else might have a different uh, sore point, right? So they might be talking to me about the fact that the cost of living has gone up. And I might ask them some questions about, okay, well, why do you think that's happening? What do you see around you? And talk to them about what they're actually experiencing and observing. They're giving you the selling point immediately. And so, you know, I, I'm giving you a long-winded way to say that, no, I don't. I don't try to get people all in or even to make a significant allocation. What I want them to do is to, first of all, can I get this person to be open to the idea of Bitcoin? Because typically they're not. What I find is that most people, and we're talking normies outside of the Bitcoin uh, community and, and sphere, most people have an opinion that is informed by very superficial headlines from the news. And fine, you know, a lot of people don't have time to investigate everything that's going on in the world. Um, so if I can send someone $5 or if I can explain one major um, way that Bitcoin can address a pain point that they've expressed, that opens them up to then at least thinking about Bitcoin. And it may well take five or six, seven, eight different conversations over time. But that's what you're trying to do is you're not trying to bombard somebody uh, with all the information that you've accumulated over years of engaging with the Bitcoin community. What you want to do is gradually bring people along. And I sadly think that a lot of people in this space don't have that perspective and don't have the patience for it. If I can get someone to make any allocation to Bitcoin, I would jump on that as a chance for success. Because once they've got that, even if it's the $5 I send them or the $500 of Bitcoin that they buy, Bitcoin is now going to be on their mind. They now have an interest in Bitcoin. When they see a news article, they're going to click on it and read it. When it pops up on the television, they're going to listen to it. If they're scrolling on some forum, they're going to participate in that discussion. And what's going to happen is their worldviews and their understanding is going to be challenged by additional information. So they're actually engaged now. They have an interest in it. And I think that cannot be underestimated how powerful that is because we call it a rabbit hole. And, you know, we all start. We, we start looking at the rabbit hole. We peer. We edge closer to it. We don't 
just jump straight down into the rabbit hole. You know, our experiences with Bitcoin, you know, we think we know enough and then you just learn even more after many years of being in the Bitcoin in, um, industry and community. So I think, I think we need to be a little bit more, I had to use the word, but, you know, compassionate, understanding and uh, empathetic as well to what their sensibilities are, not just harangue, harass, disparage people because they don't yet have the understanding that we do of Bitcoin. So that's that, you know, I've taken a long way of explaining my approach to introducing people to Bitcoin, but my, I have a minimalist approach, not a maximalist approach. Yeah, yeah no, that's, I, I, would, I would take the same way. Um, I, part of my point, though, was that I wonder if the value of 60-40 again, uh, the stock market and the bond market will rub off at all on the crypto community. And nobody was like trying to get me to go all crypto in some of the podcasts I've been doing and interactions. But I was surprised to learn they were all in, like their whole portfolio. Yeah. And I would, I would go over, like, I was curious if they even really understood why stocks and bonds make sense for like a long-term investment. Um, and that that's something that is interesting to me is whether... Yes, some of the 60-40 crowd may add a little Bitcoin, but will the Bitcoin crowd oh, I see. Uh, maybe open their mind up and see a little bit of why 60-40 makes sense, especially and how like you know compounding returns uh, can really be nice uh, over 20, 30 years, which is why 401ks are so popular. Yeah, so f f personally, I am all in. Um, uh, I may buy stocks and uh, property down the track, but for now, it's not really a focus for me, but I... I understand why somebody would buy stocks. I don't see the appeal of bonds at the moment. Um, and, you know, people people may want to argue that, but I, I don't. It's not a uh, discussion I engage in. So, you know, investing in stocks, absolutely, I understand that. There's certainly space for people to do that and own Bitcoin, plenty of space. Um, and I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't tell someone who's got a 60-40 portfolio either to make a large allocation as a first off either I, I would want them to be comfortable with the decisions that they end up making and to own them rather than to be convinced of something uh, ahead of time before they've acquired the knowledge and comfort yeah yeah no it makes sense it's an interesting thing because i go back and forth between yeah I, I i won't buy bonds i've never considered bonds i have owned stocks previously uh, and you know you make a point about compounding over the years because there have been stocks that i've sold way too early um <laughs> that i look now uh, i looked up a stock that i owned <laughs> just before i moved to london and it's like it's it's 100x there and i could have <laughs> just smacked myself in the face <laughs> it's like i had to sell that i had to sell the stock to actually fund my move to london and it's like, i look back and it's like goodness me 100x like you you only get one or two of those in your lifetime right so <laughs> i um i did the work and i uh, became too impatient so yeah i got no problem people investing in stocks bonds bonds baffled me though but you know good luck to people so my 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 um from my perspective, I want people to make an allocation to Bitcoin, not to move away from stocks and bonds. I don't care what else they own. I don't even care if you own shit coins. Well, I really don't care. Like, I don't have that I ideology. I discourage it, but I don't care. I just want people to buy some Bitcoin. Do whatever else you want to do with the rest of your money, but at, at a minimum, have some insurance against the system with Bitcoin. And then, you know, ideologically, from an investment point of view, if you get it, and if you feel more comfortable, make a bigger and bigger allocation as you see fit. But I, I want people to start, and they can orange pill themselves from that point onwards. Yeah, no, look, I'm, I'm, I, um, I may dabble in trying to 60-40 pill a couple of the Bitcoin people. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, uh, yeah. and I don't anyway, mean, that, I guess I don't mean that in the way that I wish you well. I just mean good luck in wasting your time as well. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, um, as always, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. You're, you're always a, a treat to have on with your knowledge and experience in the and the ETF space is unrivaled. And uh, I really do appreciate everything 
both yourself and James. I know I, I mentioned it on Twitter, but I'd like to mention it here. Uh, you guys have been absolute champs, keeping us informed um, months and months in advance and the work that you've done. Um, I'm sure it's been expressed by many in the community, but I'd like to take this uh, opportunity personally to thank you both. Um, you guys have been immense, and I really do appreciate it. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, it's been a trip, um, and uh, thanks for uh, having me on. And uh, yeah, I, well, I'm sure we'll we'll talk again. There's a lot. Anytime, going on. thanks, Eric. I appreciate it.